series today. Um, it's, um, it's a series that uh, God is using to take our roots down in it. And uh, let's just uh, take this confession. This is what they've done there. They've tried to move it on different sides so that even if I'm standing in the middle, you can see what is. <laughs> you can see what. How many of you would like me to quit preaching? Lift up your hands if you'd like to quit. If you'd like me to see, uh, if you'd like to see me quit preaching or quit coming to church. As a church, I want to encourage you to encourage your pastor. Yeah. Okay? Tell the people that are not here today to encourage their pastor. Because it could be just be one day just that I'm not here anymore. <laughs> I'm gone. Because I'm a human being like you. But when I'm teaching to people and all I'm teaching is God's word and they don't obey, then I, maybe I'll just, I'll just examine what I'm doing here and see if it's, it's worth it or not. But uh, God has given me a word to share today and I'm going to share it. And uh, hopefully, hopefully some people will listen. God has something to say. God has something to say. God has something to say. Listen, listen. Pay full attention for God has something to say. Want to ready go confession today? I'm humble enough to open my heart, my eyes, my ears to let God's word reach me. I participate and listen with humility. I obey and practice what I hear with faith because God is my friend. I'm receptive and fully attentive to receive all that God has for me today in His Word. Amen. We've been in this series called Rooted for week one. We talked about the subject, a Christian who is not a Christian. And then week two, we talked about the subject, the real surrender. The real surrender. All these messages are online, so you can uh, you can please take them and listen over and over again. We are going to we are going to be in Matthew chapter eleven today. I've got two Bibles with me today. I don't know what's happening today. I've got two Bibles in front of me. Well, let's find out. Matthew chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, actually, before you bring it up on the screen, let the people open their Bibles. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. It's good for you to have a Bible that you can open and turn to. Uh, we're going to read from verse 28 to 30. You know, recently I was uh, speaking to some of our team members and um, encouraging them with this text. <coughs> but we're going to go deeper with it as a family today. And if you're watching online, we welcome you as well. Uh, this is Jesus talking. Matthew 11, 28 to 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, that word yoke uh, is from the word zygos, and it's just used to describe the wooden frame that is used to join two animals. You know, when, back in the day when they, had, uh, when they have animals carrying load, so they have uh, like a wooden, a wooden uh, frame that joins two animals together so they can carry more load. So it's, a, it's an image that is used metaphorically to describe one individual in subjection to another. As you have the two animals joined together, you have, a, you have two individuals, one in subjection to the other. And then verse 30 says, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The title of our message today is Soul Care. Soul Care. Caring for the soul. You know, somebody recently asked me, it was, it was actually after the service last week, somebody asked me, how do, you, how do you manage to function effectively in all the things you do? How do you, how do you manage to function effectively in all the things you do? I don't need to bore you with all the things I do because I know some of you here have, have busy lives as well. But may I submit to you today that there is no way that I would function effectively in all the things that God has set before me without a conscious commitment to caring for the soul. There's no way you will function effectively in all the things that are before you without caring for the soul. It's a true picture for all of us. And you see, the human being, or the, the human, is made up of the body, the soul, and the spirit. Oftentimes, we just see your body. Some body's shining, some body's smelling, some body's, <laughs> some body's uh, dry, as, as the case may be. But oftentimes, when people appear, they appear in their body, and that's a physical appearance. But well, you're made up of the body, you're made up of the soul, you're made up of the spirit. In fact, you, you are a spirit. 
you live in a body and you have a soul. You are a spirit, you live in a body and you have a soul. And one of the things that make people not rooted in Christ is the state of their soul. Amen? Because as human beings, you have emotions, you have a conscience, you have a will, you have thoughts. And those things are part of your soul. All that is in your soul. And that can make us complex people. It can make us complex human beings. So when Jesus came, he didn't just come to heal your body. When Jesus came, he didn't just come to heal your spirit. In fact, when you give your life to Jesus, the first thing that gets saved is your spirit. But when Jesus came, he didn't just come to heal your, just your body, your spirit, your soul. He came to heal everything. Can you say everything? So, when people do not completely expose every part of their lives to God, then maybe they, they could be healed in their spirit and sick in their body, or sick in their body and healed and, and, and defective in the soul. But God, what God wants is that He wants to do a complete work in us. He wants to make us completely whole. But when those areas, when those three areas are not exposed to God, the body, the soul, and the spirit, then it can be difficult to be rooted in Christ. And that's why... One of the things that, that all put people away easily from, ch from church, from the kingdom of God, from Christ, is problems. Is the issues of life and how they deal with it, how they interpret it. So somebody experiences a, a disappointment, someone experiences a betrayal, and they think, oh, I can't be bothered about God anymore. And it affects their attitude to God, it affects their attitude to man. Someone experiences a betrayal and they totally ignore God. Somebody is tired physically and they totally ignore God. But isn't it interesting that people walk away from the very person who is able to help them? The very person who is able to help them with every sphere of their lives, they walk away from him. Psalm 46 verse 1 says something very interesting. Psalm 46 verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength. Can you say God is our refuge and strength? Thank you very much. God is our refuge and strength. And he goes on to say, an ever-present help in trouble. An ever-present help in trouble. That means that when trouble is present, God is present. When trouble is present, God is right there. And sometimes people make the mistake to think that when they have troubles, it's a proof that God is absent. But may I submit to you today that the presence of trouble is not a proof that God is absent. It could be a proof that God is present. Because the thing is that when you are headed in the right direction, Sometimes the enemy will attack and oppose you. But what people do is that they walk away from the very person who is able to help them in their time of need. It's just like somebody who has a financial problem, and, um, and then they see this person who is wealthy, who is rich, and the person is willing to help anybody who comes in front of them, and then they walk, you, they walk past, they walk in front of the person and walks right past without even asking for help. And the person has all the things they need. And that is why in our text, Jesus issues an invitation. You know, one of the favorite words of God is come. Come. That's one of the favorite words of God. In Bible school, you see that the Bible says that the spirit and the bride says, come. Come. And that's what you see in our text. Come. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You see Jesus say this over and over again. When he was calling his disciples, all he was telling them was, come. Come, come and follow me. He told Peter, he told Andrew, come, follow me, come, come. And when you, when, when you look at the book of Matthew, chapter 14, when Jesus was uh, calling out his disciples when they were on the boat, remember that text? He says, come. Uh, and even though he said come to all of them, it was only Peter that answered the call. And that was why Peter was able to walk on the water. But God's favorite word is come. Can you say come? Come. God likes to use that word come to me as a tender invitation to intimacy. Come. Come, 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 all those who are weary, all those who are tired, all those who have been beaten up by life. There's no way you live a life for 10, 20, 50 years, 60 years that life will not give you a punch in the face every now and then. That's, that's the reality. You see a teenager saying that he's tired of life. And I begin to wonder that what about the people that have been for 70 years? What should they say? Life will deal a, bo a blow to people every now and then. And that's why God says, come to me, come to me, all those who are weary and burdened. You know, that word weary evokes uh, the image of somebody who is exhausted from work or from a long journey. It's like when you've been on a journey for like 10 hours, you've been on the road for 10 hours, your body feels very weak. Or somebody who has gone to work from morning, maybe they left the house at 6.30 in the morning, and they go to work and there's all kinds of pressure, pressure in the boardroom, pressure 
from people giving orders, packing orders to you, and then you come back home in the night, maybe you come at 8 p.m., 7 p.m., and you can just feel that sense of weariness, of burden all over you. That is, that is the picture. That is the picture that, that God is painting here. The picture of somebody who is weary from a long journey, from, from a day of work. A picture of somebody who is burdened. Somebody who is carrying heavy loads. See, if somebody is carrying a load, a heavy load, very heavy load, let somebody, let's say somebody carries that heavy load for like 50 years, and then you see somebody else who is carrying nothing for 50 years, and you compare the two of them, there's no way you won't see a difference in, in their lives. There's no way you won't see a difference in the way they talk, in the way they act, in the way they respond to God. So God says, I have a better offer, by the way. I want to exchange my load for your load. Your load is heavy. Like real time, every day it's heavy. It's like your kids are shouting no, or the people in the marketplace are shouting no, or you've got a crazy person on the road, you've got a crazy bus driver, bus driver you've got a terrorist trying to keep people in London Bridge. Yeah, my load is light, but your load is, is heavy. Now, let's do a deal. Let's exchange the load that you've got that is about to destroy you. Let's exchange it for my load, which is light. And this is how he says this in Matthew 11, 29 to 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and, and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So watch this. The divine plan is that we constantly exchange our yoke for God's yoke. You wake up on Monday, you exchange your yoke for God's yoke. And it's not even limited to the morning. In the night, you exchange your yoke for God's yoke. Because the, cap the, the capacity of your load is, 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 is strong and it can destroy you. It can, it, can make you. it can make you weak. And there's no way we, we carry those loads and we can still function effectively in life. And that's why sometimes people, people act in a funny way because they are carrying loads that they should not be carrying. But the problem is that many people carry that load for so long that they ignore God's load. They ignore God's yoke. They ignore God. That's, that's another way to say it. They ignore God when they should be exchanging it, those yokes periodically. And that's why we have soul problems. That's why many people have soul problems. That's why many people are not rooted in Christ. Because of those heavy yokes. Because we are, we are carrying what we are not designed to carry. Yeah. I actually like the way the message translation puts it. Uh, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, the message translation says, Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Can you say come to me? Come then you see that word again. Come, come, come to me. Get away with me. And you will recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the enforced readings of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or heel fitting on you. For some reason, the enemy has convinced humanity to think that God lays heavy load on us. Or like God wants to stress us. God wants to destroy you. God wants to waste your time. God wants to lay heel fitting stuff on you. But no, he says, keep company with me and you will learn to live freely and lightly. So Jesus was basically emphasizing what it means to be rooted in him. And it, it, it's just basically describing what it means to be established in him, to be firmly rooted in him, always. And that will always lead to rest. That will always lead to rest. So God invites us to care for our soul as a medium and as a platform for us to be deeply rooted in him. Because everything flows from the soul. Can we say it together? Everything, Everything flows, flows from, the soul. from the soul. That's why we have to care for it. That's why we have to, we have to care for it. The, the word soul is from the Greek word psyche. Where you get the word psychology from? Psyche. The, the soul involves the mind and emotions. The mind and emotions. And that's what gives us the capacity to relate with other people. That's what gives us the capacity to, to form bonds. That's what gives us the capacity to respond to beauty. That's what gives us the capacity to respond to God, to the beauty of God, to the beauty of nature, to the beauty of human relationships. You know, people that don't have healthy soul, they don't know how to form healthy relationships. They don't know how to value the gift of life. They find it very difficult. You know, so basically soul care means that you are, you are maintaining your, your healthy soul. You are maintaining a healthy soul. It means that for those who are wounded, it means that they are, 
They are trying to heal that soul. They are trying to get that soul to a position where it can be healed. And therefore, those who think that they have a beautiful soul, it's about maintaining that soul, making it healthy. If somebody has an addiction, if somebody has temptations all over their faces every time, one of the ways they can overcome that is by maintaining a healthy soul. Yeah. People who do not have peace with God, one of the ways they can overcome that is by maintaining a healthy soul. And like I said, when you were saved, your spirit was saved, but your soul needs care, it needs attention. Your, your body was not saved as well. You know, the, the spirit is the human part that is able to relate with God, that is able to understand spiritual things. That's why people that are not saved, because their spirit is not saved, they cannot comprehend the things of God. That's why the Bible says that the natural man cannot comprehend the things of the spirit, because to them they are meaningless. They do not make sense. But when you are saved, your spirit gets saved. But then you go on a journey where your body can be transformed, where your soul can be healthy, can be healed. And that's why it's possible for you to be saved and have a damaged soul. It is possible for you to be an unbeliever and have an unhealthy soul, but it's also possible for you to be a believer and have an unhealthy soul. And you may be in need of soul care. And in fact, you see, sometimes you see that you, want, you begin to ask yourself questions. Why is it that people are in the church, but their actions do not prove that they are in church or that like, they sit in church? You know? It's because there's something wrong with the soul. There's something wrong with that soul. That soul is damaged. And that person may be in need of soul care, you know? So you see some believers who work hard to overcome bad habits, to overcome destructive patterns. And I think that's linked to what we're, what we're talking about last week, the real surrender. That's the process of sanctification. And people can even be in church for 50 years and they still continue to struggle for the rest of their lives because there's a damage to their soul. Yeah. For the, for the advantage we have, the invitation that God gives us in that power-packed word, come, is that it is possible for you to be saved in your spirit, saved in your body, and saved in your soul. The body, the soul, the spirit can be functioning properly as, as followers of Christ. And that's why this is the verse that I want to show you right now. This verse is the verse that many people quote, many people mention. Many preachers talk about this verse. 3 John 3. The book of 3 John verse 3. It's got one chapter. Third John has only one chapter, verse 3, verse 2. Third John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, I wish you... Oh, sorry. It's Third John, verse 2. It's not just one chapter. Third John has one chapter. Amen? Amen. Verse 2. It says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. Can you say in all things? In all, all things. In all things. In your body, in your soul, in your spirit. And then he emphasizes these things. And be in hell just as your soul prospers. The higher place, I pray for you today that you will prosper in all things Amen. and be in health, Amen. even as your soul prospers in Jesus' name. Amen. And you know, this, in, in this verse, the Apostle John is the one talking. He's the one who wrote this letter to his friend called Gaius. Gaius was a church leader in a church where the Apostle John was the over, overseer, was the oversight pastor. And in that particular church, there was, there was a lot of um, nonsense going on. Just like you have in many churches, many dramas going everywhere, all over the place. In this particular church, there is a self-willed and power-hungry man called Diotrophes. And Diotrophes, in this particular place, wants to grab power. <laughs> and what he would do is that he would openly attack the authority of the leader of the church. He would openly attack the, the people in the church and tell them, do not obey this person, do not care for this person, do not do this, do not do that. I pray that we never see anything like that in the higher place in Jesus' name. Yeah. And it will go all over the place talking about bad things in the church, just amplifying things that you shouldn't be talking about. And so, because the Apostle John knows that this kind of context is able to damage somebody's soul, he prays for Gaius. He says, I pray for you that you will be in health and that your soul will not be damaged by what is happening right now. And that's why you, that's why you see him pray that prayer. And if that happens in the church, what about in the world? There are so many things out there that are trying to steal from us. There are so many things out there that are trying to uproot us. There are, trying, there are so many things out there that are trying to, to deplete us and make us not rooted in Christ. And that is why it's so important that we care for our souls. And, and this is what I want you to remember today. See, everybody is rooted in something. Amen? Amen. Everybody is rooted in something. The idea of not being rooted is, is not true. You're rooted in something. It just, it, it just depends on where you're rooted on. And God gives us an invitation today. He says, come and be rooted in me. For instance, 
Many people are rooted in social media. That's no, that's no longer news. Many people are rooted in social media. I'll prove it to you. Let me ask you a question. What is the first thing you check when you wake up? Well, good luck. <laughs> Congratulations. Many people check their phones the first thing in the morning. That's the first thing they check. And in fact, that's the last thing many people check. That even when people are sleeping, when they are dozing off, they are still checking their phones. And they are, they are still checking, still checking their phones. And you see that constant contact with, with other people's problems, with other people's lives, is giving us a wave of depression, a wave of anxiety. And that doesn't help your soul at all. It doesn't, even, it doesn't even help your spirit. And I think it doesn't even help your body. I think in our generation today, we've lost the heart of presence, of practicing presence. You know, I was talking to somebody, I said, why is it that people find it difficult to, to hold conversations and be present in the moment? Like somebody's talking to you, and they're they are talking, hello, how are you today? How, how are you today? And you're pressing your phone. How are you today? And you're not even concentrating to even engage in conversation, in real conversation. And that's why people are sick, people are dying, people are depressed, people are hurt. And I, I mean, I submit to you today that, see, the most difficult problem you will ever face in life is not the devil. The most difficult problem you will ever face, the most difficult person you will ever face in life is not the devil. It's you. It's the man you see in the mirror. It's yourself. It's yourself. And sometimes many Christians feed their bodies three hot meals a day, and uh, we feed our spirit man one cold snack in three weeks. Because we come to church once in three weeks. Amen. <laughs> and some people don't even spend time with God's word on a day-to-day -day basis. So many people are rooted in something. The idea of not being rooted is not correct. You are rooted in something. Can you say, I'm rooted in something? Amen. You can be rooted in gossip. You can be rooted in jealousy. You can be rooted in whatever. But you are rooted in something. But the invitation God gives us through our text is what? Come. Come to me. Come and be rooted in me. Because that's where life is. That's where life is. And all the things that we are rooted in, they are stealing from us. Before your very eyes, things are stealing, are being, stole, are being stolen from you and we do not take the responsibility to defeat or fight those things. So what I want to do today for the rest of our time is uh, to put forward two things to us that uh, many of us know but we don't do. And I feel like um, God wants me to remind you today is reflected in our feedback, the feedback that we did last um, I think two weeks or three weeks ago, that many people desire to do these things, but they don't do them. And I think some of you are already guessing what these things are. Why is it that we know it, but we don't do it? But what I want to do today is just um, kind of eat the reset, touch the reset button, and maybe God would revive some people's lives or some people's uh, areas, in these particular areas I want to mention, because they are critical for maintaining a healthy soul. They are critical for soul care. The first thing is prayer. Can you say prayer? Prayer. prayer. We, all know, we all know this. Many people know this, that prayer is very important and it's very critical for maintaining a healthy soul. And at the simplest level, prayer is conversation with God. Actually, I think sometime this year, I did uh, a series called um, I Want to Pray But. I Want to Pray But. Uh, you can go and check it out. But I want to give us a simple model uh, that can strengthen us in our prayer lives and make us rooted. A simple model uh, that can strengthen us and make us rooted in Christ. Prayer is a medium through which you can become rooted in Christ. And I just want to give you this simple model. It's called the ACTS model. A-C-T-S. ACTS. As in the book of ACTS. ACTS model. And they all stand, uh, each um, alphabet stands for something. But what this helps you to do is to have a routine. Because you don't have a prayer life by accident. Without a routine of prayer, we fall into a trap where we just throw some words at God. We just throw some words or dump some requests before God. There are two words that people use a lot. Please God. Please God. Please God. Please God. Please God, get me that. Please God, go and get me that. Please God, arrange this. Please God, arrange that. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're going to sit down in that mode, but if that is the only prayer you pray, <laughs> there is something wrong with your prayer life. There's something wrong with um, the kind of um, relationship you have, you have with God. So if, you have, if, you, if that's the only prayer you're praying, you're not rooted yet. 
You are not rooted yet. So this is just a module for us, and you see, God can speak to you in many ways beyond all the. But this is just um, this is just a template to help you to begin to think about your prayer life. Uh, the first one is adoration. A stands for adoration. Can you say adoration? Adoration, adoration is like uh, you are entering a holy space, like you are preparing to enter a holy space. You know, I feel like um, we don't adore God enough. And I think I touched on this um, last week, reverence. You know, when, you, when, you, when you're adoring God, it means you're worshipping God. Adoring is it's not just singing songs. It's like you're, you are in awe of God's power. You are revering God. You are reverencing God. It, it sets, so if you enter prayer this way, it sets the tone for the kind of prayer you're going to begin to pray. It sets the tone for the kind of view you begin to have of God. Because you begin to think about the nature and the power of God. And um, when we pray with more reverence, we begin to see more, more, more of God's power. So entering the holy, you are entering the holy space. You are beginning, to, you are beginning to to talk to a holy God, a powerful God, an all sufficient God. So it's it, it's powerful when you start praying like that. So you start with adoration, adoration. And the next one is confession. Confession and confession is basically naming our faults, naming our faults. You know, there's a difference between praying like this, God, forgive me my sins, and praying, God, forgive me for backbiting about Mr. B today. There are two different things. You missed it. One is just a general prayer, but one is a specific prayer. And the reason why many people's souls are being damaged is because they are not dealing with the specifics. Amen? They are not dealing with the specific sins, specific things. There's a difference between God, God, forgive me my sins, and pray, God, forgive me for ignoring you today. Forgive me for being self-centered. That's specific. It's a specific prayer. And, that, and that's the reason why many people are carrying the yokes around. They're carrying the yoke of faults. Because they are not dealing with it specifically. You know, when it's not confessed, it's a yoke. Amen? It's a yoke. So I, I want to encourage you to deal with sin specifically in prayer. What it does is that it honors God and it preserves your soul. It clears your conscience and gives you peace with God. So the next one is Thanksgiving. 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 You know what Thanksgiving is? It's basically expressing gratitude. Expressing gratitude. Can you say expressing gratitude? Expressing gratitude. This is about expressing gratitude to God about specific things. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And it goes on to say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. His benefits. Specifics. Benefits. Forget it not. Mention it to him. Remind, thank him for it. You know, if you're, if you're a human being, you understand the value of somebody saying thank you to you. How many of you understand the value of somebody saying thank you to you? Maybe you've even said you've helped somebody and they didn't say thank you and it just breaks your heart. Somebody was sharing with, uh, with us this week about somebody they helped. And the person did not say thank you, and now they, they must feel like that person is ungrateful. If a human being can feel like that, how much more God? Amen? Amen. How much more God? But what happens is that sometimes God does this thing for you, and you think, oh, it's too small, I want to see the spectacular. Or you think, you feel like, oh God, you've done this for me, but it's not enough. Or you feel like God has done this for you, but it's, it's bigger, than, it's smaller than what God has done for Mr. B. And so you begin to compare it, but you do not feel grateful in the moment. You're not grateful in little, how will God give you more? How will God give you more? If human beings feel sad when people are ungrateful, how will God feel? You know, there's a story of the ten lepers that Jesus, Jesus healed. And for some strange reasons, nine of them just thought that was their right. They just walked away. And only one came back to say, thank you God for this. Thank you God for this. So it's powerful when we, when we pray like that. We pray thanking God for things. Specifics. The gift of life. Good help. And this is what we're going to be doing as a church family by God's grace on the 15th of December as we have praise party and even as we do the year in collection next week. It's all Thanksgiving. And the next one is supplication. Supplication. Supplication is asking for help. That's where you can pray. There's nothing wrong in asking God for things. He's your father. But it doesn't come for. That doesn't actually come for. Supplication. Asking for help. And there are different types of requests. There are different types of requests. There is a for me, I, I, I've got family requests. That's where I pray for my family. That's where I pray for my wife, for my children, for my, my in-laws, my parents, my, uh, my siblings, family. 
and then you've got ministry. Ministry, ministry, we pray. That's for me. I've got, I've got, I pray for the church members. I pray for the vision of the church. I pray for all the people around the church, all the things I feel like God is leading us to do. That's where I pray for these things. I pray for uh, the charity in, in Africa. I pray for the partners of the charity. That's under ministry. And then we've got um, people. So there is a family, there's ministry, there's people. That's why I begin to pray for every, all the people I know, all the people in my life, as much as I can remember, or God puts a name in my heart. That's why I pray for various people in my life. And then you've got prayer for personal needs. That's why I pray for my character. That's why I pray for who I am becoming. For me to be standing here before you today is a miracle. They say that many ministers give up in the, in the first year of ministry. And they say after then, the third year, many people give up again. So I've crossed the first year and the third year. Keep praying for me, amen? amen. Yeah, so that's why I pray for my needs. That's why I pray for my character. That's why I pray for my emotions. That's why I pray for my worries and anxieties. That's why I pray for anything I need help with. So there's family prayers, there's ministry prayers, there's uh, people prayers and personal needs. And the thing is, actually, I confess to you, I don't always get these things right, but especially now that I've got kids all over the place, sometimes when I'm about to pray, then a young man just runs downstairs and says, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. And that's why I try to practice more prayer walks as much as I can do. But this is a powerful template that can guide and shape your prayer life. And then you can, you can begin to throw it in every now and then, every day. And if you ever miss a day, don't miss two. Can you say amen to that? Amen. If you ever miss a day, don't miss two. Because what can happen is that people go into this kind of religiosity where they think, oh, I've got to do what they call prayer time and devotion. That's, that's what people call uh, that's, that's one of the ways they describe praying and reading the Bible daily. Devotion and prayer time. So people can fall into a trap where they say, now nah, I've got to pray. And what they do is that they basically rush through things. Let me quickly rush through the verse. So as to take the verse that I prayed today. But then you miss the real thing, which is connection and exchanging of your yoke with God. Amen? Amen. Prayer, and, prayer and all these things is just a means to an end. It is not the end. The end is basically relationship with God and communication with God. Amen? Amen. So don't miss the real thing because you're just interested in ticking the box yeah you know the, the, the average human beings uh, human being uses 5,000 words a day I, I don't think there's anything wrong if we use some of those words to converse with, with the king of kings so that is praying uh, praying as a means to care for your soul but then there's also uh, the second one which is studying the Bible studying the Bible studying the Bible we know that. Studying the Bible. Studying the Bible. Joshua 1 8 says, This book of law will not depart from my mouth, but I will meditate in it day and night. And I don't I won't just meditate in it, I will observe and do what it commands. And we're going to talk about that. Psalm 119, 102 to 105 says, I haven't turned away from your regulations, for you have taught me well. How sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. Your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I ate every false way of life. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. You know, somebody was um, talking about this. There's, there's this funny thing that somebody was uh, talking about. So we were doing this kind of, um, it was like a game. Like we were talking about different Bible verses and word. So the game is that you're expected to see where the, where the verse is. Say for instance, Psalm 1 verse 1 says, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So I will say the verse, what the verse says. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And the game is that it will tell me where it is in the Bible. And we, get, we went on back and forth. And I just thought to myself, do you know that the enemy is not interested in the specific verse where you are putting from? He's not interested in Psalm 1 verse 1. That's literally like that. He's interested in the content. It is the content that we use to defeat him. So if he says, the enemy, I rebuke you, Psalm 1 verse 1. That doesn't make sense. Amen. But when you say that, I'm a blessed man. I walk consciously in the counsel of the humble. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. That is that carries weight beyond the letter. The Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit gives understanding. Amen. Amen. So God's word, that is God's word, not just the verses like the way they have in the Bible. I mean the content. It's powerful. It's, it's a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. And if this is the powerful medium where you can exchange your yoke for God's yoke. 
Remember, he says, my yoke is easy, or your yoke is heavy. Yeah, it's, it's a medium through which I'm changed to become like Christ. It's a medium through which I have substance. If I, if I feed on God's word, my roots will go down deep. If I feed on junk, I will be depressed. If I look at your faces every day, I will be depressed. No matter how beautiful you are. If I feed on God's word, I will be refreshed. I will be revived. I will be renewed. Yeah, I will become like Christ. So this Psalm 1 was talking about um, walking in God's counsel. He said, blessed is the man that walks. Can you say walk? Walk. walk? That walks. Notice he didn't say that runs. Notice he didn't say that sits. When you're walking, what happens? Like, I walk a lot, so I, 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 I'll, I'll be able to relate with this. Like, when, when you're walking, you're not running. You're walking and you're not, you are, you are observing things because you're walking. You do, you do not miss moments when you're walking. So when you're walking, say for instance, you're walking, like in studying God, or you're walking, you're not running through it. You don't miss something because you're walking through it. You're not running through it. You're not speeding through it. You're walking through it. You begin to observe things. You begin to see pictures. You begin to have thoughts. A verse reminds you of another verse. God speaks into your soul. It revives your soul. It refreshes your soul. Yeah. That's what you do with walking. And when you, when you continue walking steadily, you will ultimately reach your destination. So the module I want to use to explain this is uh, the hear module. To, to hear, to, to listen. And they all stand for something. All the, all the alphabets stand for something. Again, you can connect with God in so many ways. God can speak to you in so many ways. But this is a module to get you thinking about your story, the way you study the Bible. The first one, H, is, is word. Can you say his word? His word. H, his word. And that basically means, as you actually read his word. Start by reading his word. Georgina, start by picking up the Bible to read it. By actually reading it. It means that you're reading a verse or a chapter. Uh, if you're watching online, or maybe you've never read, you've never had that moment where you've taken God's word, God's word consciously to read it daily, you can start with a verse. If you've been reading a verse every day, grow and start reading a chapter. Just keep growing. Read it. Start, start by actually reading it. You can start by reading the Psalms, by reading the, by the, the book of John, or decide to read through the New Testament. Some of you should decide to read through the New Testament. At the moment, I'm reading through the book of Acts. In our team meeting today, somebody said they are reading through the book of Ruth. So, read through it. I actually read um, through the New Living Translation. And this is the Bible I used to read. And you can tell when somebody has been reading the Bible a lot. Can you see, <laughs> can you see what, what life has done to this book? <laughs> this Bible was given to me um, through a group, uh, by a group of people I served in, uh, in Humio, Nigeria. I served them for one year. And when I was living, they gave me some cool money and this Bible. It's the New Living Translation of the Bible. Powerful translation, powerful, powerful version of the Bible that you can use to read. So, you can also get a study Bible to read. Actually, I was asking my wife that, what does she want for Christmas? She said, I'll send you a list. And <laughs> I said, what do you want? I was thinking one thing, <laughs> but she sent me a list. And one of the things is, uh, she put on the list is the study Bible. So you can get a study Bible. It's powerful, powerful. People say, I just want to grow. How many of you want to grow? It's here. <laughs> How to grow is here. Amen. People say, I just want, I just want, I just don't know what God wants me to do. It's here. Open it. It's clear. It's life changing. It's hope giving. It's life giving. So actually start by reading his word. And then the next one is examine it. Examine the word. Examine. 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 And that means to observe. To observe the verses. To ask yourself as you're reading through it. Is there anything I've learned about myself in these verses? Is there anything I've learned about God in these verses? Examine it. You see, it's good to keep a journal when you read, when you when you're having your quiet time. Some people will keep a hard copy of a journal. Some people will keep a, a, a journal on their phone. I prefer the hard copy though because you have the phone everywhere as distractions. Well, you've got the Bible uh, available everywhere. You can underline as you read. If you look through my Bible, you see many parts that are underlined. It's, um, it's, 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 it's great to, to study God's Word that way. But you can study God's Word on your phone if that's what you prefer. But I think it's good to do hard copy. 
um, you know, as, as complicated as life may become, taking God's yoke at heart is simply working with Jesus in the real world and having him teach us moment by moment on how to live his way. And, and that's, that's why we should examine the Bible daily, personally daily. It's like daily soul food. So examine it. The next one is apply it. Can you say apply it? Apply it. So you study it, his word, you examine it, and then you apply it. You apply it. So ask yourself, ask yourself as you study through either, how can I apply these verses to my life? How can I apply these verses to my life? Is, is there a command to obey? Is there a sin to repent from? Is there a sin to confess? Uh, is there a promise, promise that you can claim? And if you have a journal, you write it out. And you can keep yourself accountable through that. And uh, what happens sometimes is that when you're reading a verse, you know, because you've read another verse before, God brings it to life. He brings it to your remembrance and wants you to, to obey it. So that's a good one to, to write down as well. And um, the next one is, for, for her, it means respond in prayer. Respond in prayer. You know, prayer is a response. And that's why sometimes after, after I finish preaching or teaching, I tell people now, respond back to God in words. Prayer is a response to God. Sometimes you are reading a verse, it becomes a prayer point. And you, you pray about it, you respond to God. You say, God, I thank you for this. Lord, help me with this. Lord, give me the grace for this. Prayer is, is a response. So you, you read his word, you examine it, you apply it, and then you respond in prayer. So those are, those are two templates that you can use for praying and for, and for studying, the, the heart model and the, and the hair model. So if you want your roots to go down in Christ, please... Don't joke with prayer and studying God's word. There's no way you can separate the, your relationship with God from those two things. They, they connect and facilitate the move of God in your life. Yeah. That, that's what they do. And there's no way we can have rooted Christians without these, these two things. So prayer plus the word of God makes, if they make your roots go down deep in Christ. And um, you see, one beautiful thing about studying God's word is that you know, sometimes you study God. I mean, I don't know if you feel like it. Sometimes you study God's word and you, you remember it as you're studying it or remember it for like 10 minutes after you study it. You remember what he says and then you walk away and then you forget everything. Has it ever, has it ever happened to you before? Yeah. Don't worry about that. Don't worry if you forget. Because what God will do is that when you need it, he will bring it out through the Holy Spirit and put it in front of you. Amen? Yeah. Can you celebrate that? Yeah. yeah. Because if you don't study God's word, there will be nothing for the Holy Spirit to tap into. And my wife was telling me a story this weekend, and I was preaching to her. I was actually preaching this to her when she said it. She said that, uh, I won't tell you the full, the full details, but you can go and ask her at the end of the service. But she said that there was a time she was praying about something. Some of you were able to connect with this. And that she was confused. And then she went on a walk to pray. And then suddenly, the Holy Spirit brought a verse out to her. The verse is, uh, don't look at the things which are seen. Look at the things which are unseen. But the things which are seen are temporal. But the things which I was seeing are eternal. And I just jumped up. But in my head, I was thinking, if she did not study that verse before, maybe like two years ago, five years ago, there, was, there will be nothing for the Holy Spirit to bring to life yes. in our life. Can you say amen? Amen. Yeah. What if there was nothing in there? What will it bring to your remembrance? God's word is an active means for the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. But there was a time I was deeply discouraged. You know, you need to pray for pastors. Many pastors are discouraged. Many pastors are discouraged. People can have like a big church but they're discouraged. People can have a small church but they're discouraged. So there was time I was, I was discouraged and I went to pray and suddenly the Holy Spirit brought out a verse. He just brought it out to light for me. And that was the, the fuel I needed at that time to carry on. So if you are not studying God's word, there will be nothing for the Holy Spirit to bring to life. Ladies and gentlemen, prayer and studying God's word, those are our weapons. Amen? Amen. That is how we care for the soul. Yes. Prayer and God's word. See, I could talk about many things. I was talking about this on Friday. I was talking about rest. I was talking about responsibility. I was talking about restriction. I was talking about um, relationships as a way to care for your soul. But those things are in the book of Genesis. So there's no way you study the Bible, these things will begin to pop out to you. But prayer, that, that's the sum of prayer and God's word. Those are mediums to to, to care for your soul. That is our weapon. Second Corinthians 10, 3 to 4 says it like this. We are human, but we don't wage war 
as humans do. What do we do? We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, God's weapons, prayer, studying God's word. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. So if the enemy shows up, weapon. If the enemy shows up, use your weapon. If you are discouraged, use your weapon. If you've got a yoke, use your weapon. And the weapon is a weapon of mass destruction. Yes. Destroy anything. And that's why when people get the word of God into them strongly, they are bold, they are courageous, and they are not chickens. And nothing can just come and separate them from God's mighty hand. This is our weapon. I'll round off with this. How many of you have seen a hungry person before? I see a hungry person almost every week in my house. And when he's hungry, he comes and tries to, to drag me from whatever I'm doing. He will try to get my attention, to get me to get him food at all costs. He will stop at nothing. How many of you have seen a hungry person before? It shows in their face, isn't it? Yeah. There's a picture of somebody who's hungry uh, I wanted to show you. Look at this guy. He's a hungry person. But this is a cute hungry person. Some people, when they're hungry, they get cut last. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But you can see the reaction on this guy's face or you can picture the reaction in any hungry person's face. And that is because they've refused to feed their body. Are we together? Yeah. That's because somebody has refused or has been denied food for the body. And this is how they look. But imagine how people look when there's no food for the soul. When there's no food for the spirit. If we can open some of your souls right now, we are going to be shocked at the state of your soul. Amen? Amen. We're going to be shocked, we are going to be shocked at the way your soul is screaming and shouting. Because there's something wrong with the soul. The soul is hungry. So it would do us good if we, if we start to take conscious, a conscious commitment to feeding our soul, feeding our spirit. It's a, great, it's a great way to live and it's a great way to offer a better version of yourself to the people around you. But through it all, see, the best medicine for a healthy soul is a healthy spirit. It's a healthy spirit. And that's what you get, of course, through God's word. Amen. Amen. We're going to uh, pray right now. But I want to encourage us as a church, let our roots grow down deep in Christ. Let your roots grow down deep in Christ. So bow down your heads as we pray together. Uh, and, um, I'd like you to respond to God in prayer. I'd like you to respond to God in prayer. You know, prayer is a response. You hear God's word and you respond to Him. Some of you need to pray, God, help me to be committed to praying more. Help me to be committed to studying your word. We are all searching for answers. The Holy God can provide. That's why I like that song. It says, We are all searching for answers. Only you provide for you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You know, listen to this for a minute. You know, there's something called Sabbath. I was talking to uh, the World Cup about this this morning. There's something called Sabbath. Can you say Sabbath? Sabbath. Sabbath, Sabbath means rest. So the word Shabbat, rest, rest. You know, right now I'm facilitating Sabbath for you. Amen. Because this is your Sabbath. But this is not my Sabbath. Amen? Amen. This is your Sabbath. And that's why you should come to church and be ready to take it all in, whatever God speaks to you. But I need to find my own Sabbath as well after feeding, because this is work for me. I, I'm, I'm at work. I've been, I've been studying all week just to, to teach the church. But I need to facilitate my Sabbath. You need to en engage and enjoy the Sabbath as much as possible. Yeah? yeah? But what God wants is that you are, because that's what you're doing with Sabbath. You're exchanging your yoke for God's yoke. You are reprocessing your life. You are, you are looking at your life, every department of your life, with the lens of God's word. And it refreshes you. And you walk away revived. You walk away revealed. And you can face the week again with a great strength. This is your Sabbath. Enjoy it. 
and enjoy rest all through your week in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll pray for you shortly, but I want to, as, as I've been doing for the past few weeks, I want to emphasize the year-end collection next week and the week after for those who decide not to show up next week. One way or the other, God will get you. <laughs> Amen. So say these words after me. You invest, you invest in, what? in what you value. You value. Let, let's say it out loud together. You invest, you invest in, what? in what you value. You value. How many of you value an accommodation? Like you value having a roof over your head. Nobody teaches you to pay your rent, except, except you're not responsible. You're responsible, you pay your rent. That is what you do. You invest in what you value. I say this often times that you see we we are by God's grace the church is not in debt. This is a fantastic movie. If it was in debt, I would have been crying every Sunday. <laughs> or pinching people to give. Amen. Amen. But the church is not in debt. And uh, I, I don't want us to be a church that maintains. I want us to be a church that moves forward. That moves forward. Irrespective of the opposition we face, the challenges we face, we move forward. And there's no way the church can move forward practically without funds, without money. One of, one of the challenges we have is that we, we do not we do not have we have we are rich. Yeah, so but this is why we are giving next week so that we can move forward as a church in the new year. We can have new dreams, um, new visions. Not because the church is broke or not because the pastor is hungry. It's so that the word of God can go out in greater scale. You know there's a there's a woman in this church that um, you know this church this church is three years old, isn't it? Over three years old. But there's somebody in this church that, uh, that brings food for people to eat every weekend. Like from the inception of the church, sometimes people will say, uh, the, the, the people in charge of finance will say, take, use it to buy things. You say, I don't want your money. Have you given me money before? I don't want your money. And the person consistently brings things for the church to, to relax, to eat, to fellowship after the service every week for over three years. But now, thank God, the, the person has a team surrounding them to do that. But last week Sunday, Something happened to this person. Somebody, amen, are we together? Yeah. Somebody, somebody said to this person, I see that you've been a blessing to many people. Now, I want to give you a gift. And the person gave the person a car. Woo! Amen, Woo! clap, clap, if you can clap, clap. Come on, clap. <laughs> Celebrate with people when, when they're celebrating. Woo! That's in the Bible, by the way. Why are you clapping as if your hands are paying you? <laughs> clap very well, clap very well. <laughs> amen. amen. And, um, you see, I was thinking about it, that if the person that had decided to, it's not like the person cannot afford to buy a car. For instance, they could have decided to use all the money that they've been using to buy food for you and say they want to save it up to buy a car for themselves or for themselves or just buy a car through one, through one means or the other. But I think it proves that God owes no man. And you say God owes no man. God owes no man. And the reality is that whatever you do for God, whatever you do for man, man may not notice, but God will notice. God will notice. And uh, the person kept on saying, wow, wow, wow. Look at um, what somebody I've never helped did for me. Because you know, sometimes you, you, I think it's a picture of a farmer. As a farmer, a farmer plants a seed in the ground and they expect a harvest to come from that same place, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like if you plant corn, you're not expecting corn, corn to go and grow in the United Kingdom. You plant it in Nigeria. You expect corn to grow from that same land. Yes. But that's a farmer. But for us as followers of Christ, when we plant a seed here, the harvest may not come from the same place, yeah. but the harvest will come. Yeah. Whatever it is, it will come. And it's much more beyond, uh, it's beyond cars and houses and material things. When we are planting seeds next week, it's a seed of sacrifice that would, that would birth souls, that, can, that has the potential to change somebody's life. And that person may not even notice, but God will notice. Yeah, yeah God will notice. So I want to encourage us to, to pray about this as a family. You couples can pray together and pray about and ask God, what would I do? What would you like us do as a sacrifice to get this mission to continue to move forward? And um, next year we're going to be having various outreaches. And um, the, 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 the gospel has never been needed than it is right now. And I want us to partner together to get the world around. How many of you have noticed that the world is now crazy? The world is now crazy. Schools are crazy. The roads are crazy. The bridges are crazy, anything can happen. <laughs> but the word of God is the answer for our world today. That if people can plug into God's word, anything can happen. And that's why we want, to, we want this space to continue to be a space where people can plug in, you know, where people can enjoy God's power and grace. So I want to encourage you, 
7,200 is the target, and uh, we're going to let you know the amount. So two things, pray about what God will have you give, and uh, pray about somebody that you will invite to church and see them here next year. Um, lastly, there are cards that we've given out last week, but there are, there are cards still available for you to pray and write your request. Let's bow down our heads as we pray together. God, we thank you for every word spoken here today, for everyone who has received it. God, I ask that you bless these words in their hearts. Make it simple. Let it be made simple. Let it be a part of us. I want to take time and spend time with you and fellowship with you and pray and study your word and be revived and be renewed and be transformed from the inside out. Thank you, Jesus, for this season that we are entering the season of Christmas, the end of the year. Lord, we want to see you in our church. We want to see you in our lives. Encourage us and establish us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God, everybody. Amen. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Can we put together our offerings, our tithe?